Hello there, and welcome to my uh, talk, virtual tour, on carers in history. Uh, my name is Rebecca. Uh, this is a photo of me and my husband, Gordon, for whom I am a full-time carer. And it's, um, uh, I'm sure many carers feel like this, that, that when you're a carer, you sometimes feel like a, a slightly invisible, unimportant tangent from the person you care for. Um, which, which isn't the case, of course, in reality, but sometimes we feel like that. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd see if there were carers in history, if there were visible people uh, who'd cared in history to see. Uh, so I'm a bit of a history nerd. Um, sort of a caveat and an apology in one. Uh, apologies for the kind of London-centric nature of the content. Um, both my husband and I used to be tour guides primarily in London. So a lot of our knowledge and research uh, is is London based, um, and uh, I'm I'm studying history now, so I'm broadening my horizons. But it's Twenty years of London knowledge versus a couple of years. Uh, so apologies in advance uh, for the London centric. I do appreciate there are carers all over the world. Uh, right, it's been years since I've done this. I'm a bit nervous. Let's go. So, I think there's this idea that in prehistory and ancient history, uh, life was cheap and anyone who was old or a burden to society or had a disability or was unwell was chucked on an ice floe or sent up a mountainside to die or something. Um, and and that, those things probably did occur, uh, almost certainly. There are some terrible things that happened in ancient history and, and prehistory. But in a really extreme version of a postcode lottery, there are some time periods and some areas where people were cared for by, by um, their family or, or community. Since we were humans, really, and the Neanderthals, there's lots of Neanderthal skeletons where there are healed injuries. And human skeletons throughout the world and throughout history, really, um, where there are injuries that are bad enough that at some point that person would have had to be cared for. For example, uh, this is the Amesbury Archer. The Amesbury Archer was a man discovered near Stonehenge. Uh, he lived in 2300 BCE. And when the skeleton was discovered, there was an injury to his um, left kneecap. Basically, he'd lost, lost his left kneecap in an injury years before his death which is a pretty horrific injury, and he must, somebody must have cared for him uh, as he recovered from that injury. So the Amesbury Archer um, would have had a carer uh, of some description, whether that was a family member or a professional carer, we don't really know. Uh, the Vikings and the Romans, uh, again, have bad reputations for what they did to people who were um, disabled or elderly. Um, and again, it's the postcode lottery thing. There are cases of people being looked after. Uh, I, I think my favorite example uh, is a, a chap called Ivar the Boneless, who led the great heathen army in the ninth century. Um, his name does suggest uh, he's described as having either no bones in his legs or, or no legs at all. So he clearly had some kind of mobility problems uh, around his legs. And he's even sometimes depicted as being carried. The people carrying him are probably slaves, being the Vikings. That's what they did. But he's always mentioned, Ivar the Boneless is always mentioned with his brother, Abba. Uh, and my personal theory is that Abba was Ivar's carer, facilitating him to pillage and invade England. So that's nice. This, this is a, a depiction of that ninth century invasion. So in there somewhere is Abba and Ivar. So from the uh, uh, medieval period, late Saxon and medieval period, uh, monasteries were springing up around uh, England and the UK. So if there was nobody to care for you at home, uh, you might end up in a monastery hospital, infirmary. Um, well, the monastery hospitals from, from the sort of 7th century, the Saxon period, the, the infirmaries were usually only for the monks and nuns. Um, there's a, a, an infirmary in Whitby, which is recorded as in the seventh century as having a, a, an infirmary for those who were infirm or near death. 
So that's that sounds like that's that's quite intensive care that they were giving there. Um, but gradually from then, the, the monastic hospitals started opening to the local people and then more generally. Um, Geoffrey Chaucer, the, the uh, medieval author, was cared for at the monastery at Westminster, uh, Westminster Abbey. In the last year or so of his life, we, we, we this photo is of the general area where the infirmary was um, at Westminster Abbey. And there was also pilgrimages. So this is the shrine at Westminster Abbey, again, of Edward the Confessor. Um, pilgrimages were considered to have real power in the medieval period. So if you were a medieval carer, you might even, one of your duties, as it were, might be to accompany the person you were caring for to a shrine, either a local or national or even international shrine. Um, or you might go as a proxy as well. That that would have been considered a role of a carer, I guess, because um, it was considered a real way of healing uh, was to go to a shrine. But there were, uh, in, in probably monasteries everywhere, but the only time I've heard of it personally is at Canterbury Cathedral, uh, there were monks and nuns who were designated as carers for the pilgrims. So it's part of the monks and nuns jobs to look after pilgrims generally when they were on their pilgrimage to provide food and drink and things. But there were specific monks and nuns who cared for those who were less able, who had mobility problems to help them get around the cathedral to help them to the shrine. So this is one of the windows at Canterbury Cathedral with the monk in the middle there um, helping out. Um, so there were people, there were carers who were monks and nuns. I mean, sadly, all those monks and nuns, for the most part, all those carers, uh, medieval monastic carers go unnamed, apart from the odd one or two who was venerated or sanctified in some way. All right, what's next? Um, so you're a medieval carer uh, and you're in pre-Google, pre-NHS 111 days. Where do you go for advice? Uh, well, you you probably would have had some knowledge of herbs and things, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, folk medicine. Um, but if you didn't have that, you might go to your local wise woman. Unfortunately, a, a big way that we know about wise women is because so many of them were accused of witchcraft. Um, I, I'm trying to keep, it, keep this sort of the positive side of history. Um, so I'm not going to talk about one of the, the bad outcomes uh, for witchcraft. Um, but there was a woman in 1605 who lived in South Perrot, Dorset, called Joan Guppy. Um, her neighbour, uh, Judith Gibbs, accused her of bewitching her and making her ill. And so Judith decided that she would get a drop of blood from Joan Guppy, because that was a, it was a kind of a witch cure. If you believed you'd been cured by, if you believe you'd been cursed by a witch, rather, uh, the cure was to get a drop of the witch's blood. Um, so Judith tries this. Unsurprisingly, Joan Guppy was uh, not not particularly willing to give up a drop of her blood. So Judith and her siblings ended up beating the poor woman up. And this all went to court um, with, um, you know, Joan accusing them of assault and them counter accusing her of, a, of being a witch. Really dangerous accusation in the 17th century. Fortunately, Joan Guppy had obviously done a lot for her community. So, so she was, um, I, I, I'm feeling her as like the district nurse uh, of the area. So she's helping everybody. And the residents of South Pirate drew up a document to go to the king, I think, uh, stating unequivocally that Joan was not a witch. She helped the community. She helped with wounds. She helped with illnesses. Um, she was the carer for that community. And she was absolutely 100% not a witch. And I'm pleased to say Joan was found not guilty of being a witch. Okay, so you've gone for your, to your wise woman for advice, um, but she's not willing to help, or maybe she's been carted off as a witch, or, or you haven't got a wise woman in your village. Um, there were books that you could consult if you were literate. You could consult books, but they were a bit uh, hit and miss like googling for something really you know some of the websites aren't particularly uh, 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 reliable so there was a 12th century german nun saint hildegard of bingen 
Um, she wrote a medical textbook. Uh, her cure for um, problems with your eyes was to stare at green grass for several hours. So give that a try. And there was a, a 14th century doctor who um, advised if you had smallpox, you surrounded yourself with red things, that it was foolproof. And there was a remedy in, in when the Great Plague hit London in the 17th century. Um, it was an old remedy, actually, to write abracadabra on your door or, or write it on a charm and carry it around. Um, the magic word, as it were. Um, but there was someone who tried to write accessible self-help books that were helpful and had accessible ingredients, not, not the hair of a virgin from the moon of a sun or whatever. Uh, and it was this chap, Nicholas Culpepper. Nicholas Culpepper was a, a, a apothecary herbalist in the 17th century East End of London. Um, so I guess a bit like going for your far to your local pharmacist for advice uh, in the 17th century, if you lived in London, you'd go to Nicholas Culpepper uh, for advice. By the way, if you are a carer, I cannot state enough how useful it is at being friends with your local pharmacists. Uh, become a become a local uh, a regular at your local pharmacist. They really do give the best advice. Um, so in the 17th century, uh, Nicholas Culpepper wrote a book. So he wrote a book that was affordable and accessible and had like normal ingredients um, to help people and ingredients that are still used today. So Nicholas Culpepper wasn't doing mad things like staring at green grass. Um, he suggested a, a drink of lemon, thyme and honey for a cold. And he suggested uh, foxglove or digitalis for heart complaints, although he said that one needed to be treated very carefully. Uh, poor old Culpepper, the, the medical establishment at the time weren't very happy about him doing this. They, they didn't want people to get cheap advice uh, for curing their ailments. They wanted, to, they wanted people to give them a lot of money and pay for their learned advice as doctors. Um, so they accused Culpepper of being a witch. Again, dangerous thing in the 17th century. Once again, a good news story. He, he, he was not found guilty of being a witch. Um, he was a bit disillusioned, though, and he joined the Civil War, he became a battlefield medic um, with the Civil War in, during the English Civil War. There was another, apothe uh, uh, another apothecary around the same time, uh, John Conyers, also living in London, in the city of London this time. Um, and he, like many others, risked his life uh, to stay in London during the Great Plague of 1665. Um, down in the bottom right of this painting, there's one of the... Um, plague doctors in their get up, their beaked mask. A lot of people, a lot of doctors and herbalists and pharmacists and nurses did stay in London during the Great Plague. Some of them were for um, less than honest reasons. They were just trying to make a bit of money selling ridiculous cures. Um, but some of them like John Conyers were genuinely trying to help the people they looked after as, as, as best they could. Uh, many of them died of the plague. Uh, Conyers didn't. Conyers did survive the Great Plague. Good for him. Um, that big mask wasn't as stupid as it looked, obviously. Uh, but the following year, Conyers left, lost his home and his business in the Great Fire of London. Though he did set up again. So, after the dissolution of the monasteries, when Henry VIII had his little falling out with the Roman Catholic Church, um, the monasteries were got rid of, which were a major source of health care. Uh, in the medieval England. Henry VIII gets rid of them. Uh, so the, the uh, care for the vulnerable people in society was transferred to parishes, so parish churches. Uh, so things like workhouses and parish nurses, and things like that. Uh, and Henry VIII also started to make it kind of fashionable, the thing, uh, uh, socially advantageous to give money to local causes so people would brag about how oh i'm supporting my retired butler or the lady that nice old lady around the corner uh, 17th century artist mary beale bragged that she donated 10 percent of her earnings to charity a lot of that was probably going into her local parish um once again the the, the noise is often about sort of the bad things that happen in workhouses and how dreadful workhouses were and the, the terrible parish nurses who killed their patients through neglect or incompetence. Um, I, and there were, I mean, some workhouses were absolutely appalling. Um, if, certainly if you were an able-bodied 
poor person going into the workhouses was just just dreadful um, it, it, it not place it to places to be avoided at all costs but uh, the infirmary side of workhouses so for older people or people with disabilities were not brilliant by today's standards but a bit a bit better um, than the workhouse image uh, we're often given uh, this is certainly a, a, a rose-colored image uh, even of an infirmary uh, area of a workhouse but they were I mean people survived in infirmary workhouses for for years so they were caring for them reasonably well um, some of the infirmaries in monasteries were carried on but not the monks and nuns doing the caring they brought in other people to do the care um, so Elizabethan playwright Ben Johnson uh, was cared for in the grounds of Westminster Abbey after a stroke in 1628 left him bedbound. Um, presumably, he was staying in the part of the abbey that was the old infirmary because they would have had kind of facilities and room. Uh, one of Ben Johnson's friends, Isaac Walton, visited him quite regularly and said that he was his long-term carer uh, was a, a, a woman who he annoyingly didn't name. Um, but that woman must have looked after him very well because he was uh, uh, he survived for nine or ten years after his stroke. Uh, so she must have cared for him reasonably well. Something else that fell to the parish uh, was looking after orphaned or abandoned children. So there were orphanages and uh, things like that. The the. In London, at least, I, 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 I'm ashamed to admit, I don't know whether this was common in other parts of the country, but in London, you could, uh, if you found yourself unable to cope with a child, uh, you could leave them in the parish. Now, people did often just abandon the child in, in churches. In, in London, it was also at the Inns of Court, which was kind of legal hubs, and from the 1740s, anyway, the, the foundling hospital. Um, older children might go to workhouses, might... Uh, orphanages rather or might end up in workhouses uh young children babies would have been sent to foster carers uh by the parish and the parish would have paid these foster carers generally um there's one well i think a nice story um some of the foster carers were obviously not nice um but the nice ones uh always get ignored and we're going to talk about one of them so in 1761, a baby girl was abandoned in this church, um, St. Dionys Back Church in the city of London. It doesn't exist anymore. It was um, been demolished. Um, the baby was given the name Charlotte Dionys after the church where she'd been uh, abandoned. Um, she was a, a, an unwell baby, um, but she was sent out to foster carers in Chigwell, Essex. Um, by the name of Anne and Nathaniel Collop. So she was sent out to Chigwell, Essex, lovely area, uh, very different to inner city London anyway. So perhaps they were hoping the fresh country air um, would revivify her. Um, certainly the care the Collops gave her must have been good. Uh, she, she grew up, but the Collops realised that she was always having fits. Really difficult to diagnose in history what those things could be. Um, fits could be almost any complaint um, but Charlotte was looked after by the Collops until she was 20 would have been reasonably unusual uh, usually she would have been sent to an apprentice uh, or sent into service when she was a young teenager um, so her condition was uh, serious enough that she was looked after by the Collops uh, until she was 20 with some spells uh, in a rest home in Spitalfields in East London uh, where she could get 24-hour care and where presumably her foster parents could get some respite. Uh, when she was 20 she was offered a job in an inn in Chigwell, in fact this inn that's pictured here, um, but I, d I can't find any details of her after that. I don't know whether she took up the job or what happened to her or whether she stayed with the Collops, I'm not really sure. So a, a good outcome uh, for Charlotte from being abandoned as a baby. Um, to having loving foster carers. So the home uh, that Charlotte went to was in Spitalfields, uh, would have given 24-hour care and respite for her foster parents. And there were other homes apart from workhouses and orphanages, things like that, 
Um, there were homes uh, like the one in Spitalfields around the country, uh, some formal, some informal. So from the 17th century, the 1600s, there were homes in London. This is a Greenwich Naval Hospital in Chelsea, Royal Hospital Chelsea, for injured servicemen or retired servicemen and sailors. Uh, so there were those both in London and in other parts of London, uh, other parts of the country, sorry. But there were also from the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, some industries did start opening their own convalescent homes for their workers who'd been injured. Uh, so this is a miners convalescent home uh, in Grange over Sands, uh, which opened in uh, uh, 1914. And this is a place called St. Anne's in Bridlington, which was a convalescent home, which was free. It was charitable. So it was for, um, I think it was originally for workers in factories, but eventually it was for everybody. Because of course, working in mines and factories and industry in the 19th century was incredibly dangerous. Uh, you stood a really high chance of getting some kind of um, uh, illness or uh, injury. So most of the time those workers would have ended up in the workhouse but there were this odd few places around the country where there were convalescent homes that would look after you uh, and care for you. But there were also homes like the ones Mary Seacole uh, ran. Um, so this is Mary Seacole, who is most famous for her work in the Crimean War, um, opening a care home, uh, not care home, sorry. Well, a hospital in a way. She called it the British Hotel, but she looked after soldiers uh, who were injured or sick. Uh, in the Crimea. Um, but before that, she'd been a carer in Jamaica, uh, where she was from. She'd cared for her husband and for an, a late, an elderly lady she worked for. Uh, she'd also opened a uh, another sort of care home slash hotel in Panama, where she looked after people during a cholera outbreak um, and treated poor people for free in, in the one in Panama as well. She came back to London after serving in the Crimean War uh, and sadly money worries. She, she had had the idea, I think, of opening a similar home in London, um, particularly having seen how badly um, the, the poor suffered in London at the time. Um, but she never could get the money together. But she did become in the um, 1870s the personal masseuse to the Prince of Wales, who had um, rheumatism, arthritis. Um, so she she did carry on her care work just in a sort of different way, in a private way. And this is Catherine Pine. Uh, uh, well, that's actually Emmeline Pankhurst in the bed and Catherine Pine looking after her. Catherine Pine and another nurse called Catherine Townend uh, started a rest home in Notting Hill in West London uh, that looked after suffragettes who'd been um, force fed in prisons or been victims of other um, violence. Uh, during the suffrage campaign. Uh, and Catherine Pine set up this nurse home, uh, this care home to care for those suffragettes who'd been injured. So uh, parish nurses we were talking about earlier, Anne Collop, who looked after Catherine Dine, uh, Charlotte Dynas was a parish nurse, technically, though she was a foster carer. Really. Um, and this is, uh, parish nurses did get a bad rap for being kind of grumpy and brusque and some incompetent. Uh, so this, this, cartoon is clearly making fun of them but I've definitely made that face at three o'clock in the morning uh so yeah the the parish nurses did get a bad rap and and some of them were like criminally bad uh but a lot of them were probably just trying to do the job the best they could and there also were less less formal um people who saw it as their their duty to care for people in their community uh, one of the more colourful examples that I've discovered is uh, somebody called Princess Serafina. Uh, Princess Serafina was born as John Cooper, but chose to dress as a woman and chose to use the female pronoun and the name Princess Serafina. Um, there was a trial in the Old Bailey in 1732, uh, which she was involved in, and her neighbours leapt to her defence. Uh, all using her chosen pronoun and using her name and saying that she was always dressed very fashionably like these ladies here uh, and always dressed very lovely and and, and uh, they also said that she cared for neighbors their neighbors people in their community she lived near near the strand or sort of strand aldwych area in london 
uh, and they specifically quoted that she had nursed Mr. Tull and his wife when they were suffering from syphilis, recovering from syphilis, uh, a, a disease which would have held a certain amount of stigma in the 18th century. Uh, and they might have found it difficult to find people to look after them. But Princess Serafina doesn't seem to have minded, I guess, dealing with stigma of her own. Um, despite the rather homophobic laws um, at the time, I'm pleased to say Princess Serafina, there were no charges uh, against her at the Old Bailey in 1732. And I can't find any trace of her. Hopefully she carried on in her community looking after the tiles of this world. Actually, one of my ancestors, I think, may have been a parish nurse or an informal nurse like Princess Serafina. Um, one of my ancestors, my um, four times great grandmother, also called Rebecca, uh, was a nurse of some description in the St. Pancras area in the mid 19th century. She sprint, spent the last couple of decades of her life in and out of um, St. Pancras workhouse. Not as a nurse, as an inmate. Um, in the last couple of decades of her life. As far as I can tell, she didn't work at the workhouse as a nurse, but she did um, on several occasions uh, sort of book herself out of the infirmary. So she was staying in the, at the infirmary end of the workhouse, where the sort, of, the sort of older people's home, I suppose, of the workhouse. Um, she did occasionally book herself out. Uh, at one occasion in the uh, when she was uh, in her late 70s, uh, quite a good age for the 19th century, particularly for a working class woman, she was in her late 70s and she arranged to be discharged for a few hours. The reason on, on the workhouse register is out nursing. I can't find any more details about it at all. But my sort of theory is that one of her patients from when she was a nurse needed her, wanted her. And she said, yeah, all right, I'll come around. I'll see how you are. Uh, but had to go back into the workhouse because she wasn't quite well enough to look after herself. And she still went out to look after one of our old patients, I think. Um, I, I do think that if anybody went back into their family tree, they would find carers. Um, it, it's uh, quite cathartic if you are a carer and have the uh, patience for going back into genealogy. Well, my my immediate family uh, is my sort of immediate family and extended family contemporary is filled with doctors and nurses and paramedics and people who care for family members and people who've been carers in care homes and people who care for animals. Uh, there's loads of us, uh, our, our family. Um, but my ancestry is also filled with them. My grandparents were foster carers. This is not them, by the way. This is just kind of a fun picture. Um, they were foster carers for lots of children, including children with disabilities. And my grandfather looked after my grandmother um, when she was ill as well. Um, my great grandparents, uh, William and Ma Maria, um, looked after William's sister, Emma. Um, Emma had lived with her parents until they went to a retirement almshouse. They were given a place in a retirement almshouse. And so Emma went to live with her brother. Emma was described in one of those dreadful 19th century terms as mentally afflicted. Could be a lot of things, but she never lived alone. She always lived with her parents or her brother and never really had a job. She worked occasionally as a shirt finisher from home, but that doesn't seem to have lasted very long. Um, so she stayed with my great grandparents at their home in, in Hackney Downs, which is where this uh, old postcard is from. Uh, and my third great grand, my three times great grandparents, uh, Joseph and Mary, cared for their son, Robert, um, who had uh, his condition is described variously as mania or epilepsy. Again, that epilepsy doesn't necessarily mean epilepsy in, in the 19th century. It, it could be other conditions diagnosed as epilepsy. He lived with them for his um, childhood and into his adulthood. Uh, when he was 30, um, they admitted him to Brookwood Asylum in Surrey. Um, they were nearly 70 at the time and retired. And it's it's perhaps they felt unable to look after him anymore or his condition got worse. Um, but he lived at Brookwood Asylum in Surrey for a few years uh, until Robert too sadly passed away. Um, and another great aunt, uh, Emma, cared for her husband, Leonard, after he was badly injured, uh, serving with the East Yorkshire Regiment uh, around the time of the First World War and was unable to work for um, 20 years or so afterwards, but did recover eventually. Um, I, it was it's cathartic for me, I think, to think that uh, I've got all these carers in my ancestry. Uh, it, it's, uh, it can be quite lonely, I think, being a carer, even though you've got the person you care for, 
uh, with you all the time and you've got maybe nurses and carers coming in in and out you can feel quite lonely I think uh, and I, it's probably silly but I, I like to think that when I'm feeling a bit lonely and it's all feeling a bit hard I think oh well at least granddad would be proud of me uh, at least great aunt Emma would be proud you know um, so it's kind of nice I think so anyway but of course it's not just my family um, who have a lot of carers. Uh, I, th I think probably every family has a lot of people with uh, carers in their family. Um, but I, I want to talk about some famous carers, carers who have actually got into history and are named and we know their carers. Um, the royal family, when they were unwell, obviously they've got an army of servants uh, to act as carers. They're, they're, in a few cases, actually maybe all cases, I just don't know about all of them, there was one specific person who acted as a carer, um, probably with the servants doing the less pleasant um, parts of caring. If you're a carer, you know what I mean. Uh, in the Tudor courts, they did have in the court people with um, physical or mental impairments. Um, I'm afraid usually as a sort of sideshow entertainment, I'm afraid it was usually the courtiers laughing at them. Although it, I, for some of them, it did give them a, a sort of chance to pursue another career. Um, Henry VIII's court was what was known as a natural fool called Will Summers. Um, that's Henry VIII on the left there playing the harp, and that's Will Summers in green. Uh, natural fools were people with um, learning disabilities or autism. Uh, they were, I mean, people thought they were funny, laughed at them rather than with them, unfortunately. Um, but they were also considered to have kind of a natural wisdom um, to them. So they were sometimes consulted um, by royals and uh, Henry VIII seems to have been very fond of Will Summers. Uh, there's Will Summers again. Uh, he, he, Will Summers features in kind of family portraits of Henry VIII. So he seems to have been very close to the king. Uh, and it was understood that Will could not cope with everyday tasks. So he was a member of the court, was sort of assigned to him as his carer. I'm afraid the Tudor word was keeper, but let's stick with carer. Um, his name was William Satan. I don't have a picture of William Satan, um, but we know the name of a Tudor carer uh, who was looking after Will Summers. Still with the Tudors, um, Henry VIII's sixth and final wife, uh, Catherine Parr, who managed to outlive him, uh, is recorded as being one of the few people who could cope with the king in his later years. Uh, in his later years, Henry VIII had a whole catalogue uh, of ailments and um, things that must have been really painful for him. To be fair, he must have been in quite a lot of pain quite a lot of the time. And his mobility was very, very affected. Um, but Catherine Parr was said to be one of the few people who could cool his temper as well as manage his pain. Um, and I think a lot of carers will recognise that it's not always looking after the physical stuff. It's looking after the mental things as well, trying to keep people calm. And I hope none of you are caring for anybody as difficult as Henry VIII, for goodness sake. Um, but so, yeah, Catherine Parr seemed to have had the gift um, for looking after the dental welfare of her patient. Skipping forward a couple of centuries and a bit um, to King George III's fourth daughter and 11th child, Princess Mary. This is her as a young woman. Um, Princess Mary was the main carer for her younger sister, um, Princess Amelia, who was the 15th child uh, of George III. And. Um, Amelia was, from her teenage years really, she was ill on and off with various complaints, which does suggest some kind of underlying um, condition. Uh, and Princess Mary seems to have kind of taken it upon herself to stay with Princess Amelia all the time and update the family when she was ill and make sure she was okay and get her the right kind of care and the right kind of um, place to stay. Um, Amelia died, sadly, when she was only 27 in 1810 from the, from the measles. Um, and in the same year, their father, King George III, um, became very ill with his um, mental illness that he'd suffered from probably his whole life. And George III was shut up in Windsor Castle and some dreadful treatments uh, were done to him. And most of the family deserted him. But our good old Princess Mary decided that, again, took it upon herself to stay with her father at Windsor Castle, uh, make sure he was getting the right care, although she probably wouldn't have had a lot of say in a lot of the uh, doctor's treatments, 
Um, but she tried to make him as comfortable as she could and again kept the family informed uh, as to his condition. So Princess Mary seems to have taken it upon herself uh, to be the carer for the royal family. Good honour. And more recently, um, Charlotte Bill uh, was the, the, the governess, the, nurse, the nursery nurse, uh, the nanny for the children of King George V and Queen Mary. Their youngest child, Prince John, who's pictured here with um, uh, Charlotte Bill, who was known as Lala. Um, Prince John had epilepsy and learning difficulties. I I'm afraid the royal family don't cover themselves in glory when it comes to people with um, disabilities. Uh, and poor Prince John uh, was shut away at Sandringham on the Sandringham estate uh, with Lala Bill as his main carer. Uh, I, I don't think a lot of the royal family had very much to do with him. Uh, although Prince John seems to have had a lovely time keeping a flock of geese. Um, Lala cared for John until he died, tragically at the age of 13. Leaving the royal family, we've got Christina Rossetti here. Uh, the poet Christina Rossetti uh, cared for her father. Uh, in 1843, when Christina Rossetti was only 13, um, her father was, uh, uh, who, who was a teacher at King's College and a poet himself, he was d d diagnosed with persistent bronchitis and um, failing eyesight and had to give up his work at King's College and stay at home, virtually housebound. Christina Rossetti was the only one who stayed in the house with him because everybody else had to go out and work. So her mother and her sister and her brother, one of her brothers, went out to earn money to support the family, and the other brother, um, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, was at art school at the time. So Christina Rossetti ended up being the only person at home with her um, unwell father, acting as his carer, uh, and his mental health began to suffer. He began to suffer from depression, uh, and sadly, Christina Rossetti also um, suffered a nervous breakdown perhaps pressure from her caring. If you are a carer, look after your mental health. Honestly, there's there's so many things that you can get access to to help you. Christina Rossetti wouldn't have had access to any of that, but please go to Carers UK, find out what you can do. Um, she did recover. Her father did sadly die from his condition, um, but Christina Rossetti recovered. That's her sitting on the steps there with her brothers and mother. Uh, and she grew up to be a wonderful poet. The Goblin King in, in the Bleak Midwinter, by the way, if you're struggling to remember a Christina Rossetti poem. John Milton, the 17th century author, who's contributed more words to the English language than any other single author, including Shakespeare and Dickens. Um, words like pandemonium and outer space and murky and fragrance and stunning and slow motion and enjoyable and loads of others. I think it's like 600 words. Um, but he also had failing eyesight. He lost his sight completely um, by 1652. Uh, his three daughters, Anne, Mary and Deborah, acted as his carers uh, and transcribed his poems, including Paradise Lost, um, and also looked after him. I, I can't imagine 17th century London was terribly kind to somebody with um, who was blind. Um, despite a somewhat turbulent relationship. The, the, he, Milton had apparently not had a great relationship with his daughters, and despite that, they still cared for him. I, I, again, I think a lot of carers can recognise that, that you, some family members can be difficult. But you care for them anyway. Um, this is social reformer Christina Black, uh, Christina Black, who was involved in um, sort of early TUC and the um, Match Girls strike and uh, the suffragette campaigns, things like that. Uh, she became the carer for her disabled father. Um, so her father had some kind of illness. I, I, I have to admit, I don't know what that meant. He lost the use of his legs. So his mother, their mother, rather, was the um, carer. Uh, but she unfortunately died in 1875 after an injury sustained while she was lifting her husband. Thank goodness for hoists these days. Uh, so Clementina Black uh, became not only the carer for her father, her disabled father, but also for her seven younger siblings and holding down her job as a teacher and a novelist and a journalist. Um, so she was definitely a working carer. She did very well. 
the much maligned gardener, Ellen Wilmot, um, was the carer for her mother in the last uh, couple of years of her life. Uh, Ellen Wilmot's mum suffered from rheumatism very badly, which actually Ellen Wilmot did as well, her, always having problems with her back. Um, must have been dreadful for a gardener to have problems with her back. Um, when her mother was in her final year or so, uh, Ellen Wilmot, took it upon herself to care for her mother uh, at their home in Worley, as well as keeping her beautiful garden up, of course. Um, but Ellen Wilmot became so kind of isolated herself um, from everybody uh, to care for her mother. Her friends became really worried about her. Uh, fortunately, her mother's doctor also started treating her, also started worrying about um, uh, Ellen. Um, I, th I think I did that to a certain extent when I was a new carer. Um, sort of, you become as obsessed with looking after the person you're looking after, and you forget that there's a, a whole world out there. Um, uh, so yeah, if you're guilty of that as well as a carer, just uh, give one of your friends a ring. Um, a young man called John Chapman, who I don't have a photo of. This is his parents. Uh, was born with a disability, described as paralysed from birth. And um, this is his mother, Annie Chapman, and his father, also called John. Uh, his parents tried to care for him in Windsor, uh, where they lived at the time, um, but they 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 were struggling. So they moved to the east end of London, hoping to get John care at the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel Road. Um, unfortunately, that, that's not how it worked at the time. The poor laws meant that you were supposed to receive parish care from the parish you were born in. And for young John's case, that was Windsor. So he ended up being sent back to Windsor, where they'd just moved from. Uh, his parents stayed in the East End. Uh, they, they were not having a good time of it. Uh, as well as caring for John, uh, their daughter um, passed away. Uh, and they they took it very badly. They they separated and turned to drink. And uh, well, caring can be can be tough. Uh, I, my husband and I were warned that it might ruin our relationship. It did not. Um, but obviously, caring did have an effect on John and Annie. Um, so they stayed in the East End. Tragically, in eighteen eighty eight, Annie Chapman was murdered by Jack the Ripper. Uh, young John Chapman was. Um, sort of adopted by his aunts, Georgina and Miriam, uh, took custody of him and decided to bring him back from Windsor and care for him at their home in Knightsbridge, um, where he lived with them uh, for the rest of his life. The, the, the must have been difficult. He was paralysed from birth. Uh, and I don't know if you can see that, but these, these houses have got, this is one of the houses here is, is the one where they lived. And they've got steps going up to the front door. That must have been very, very challenging. Uh, for two elderly women, eventually, uh, and a grown man. Um, something I can relate to, that's my husband demonstrating how difficult it was for us to get out of our old flat, which was a first floor flat with no lift. I'm pleased to say we're now in an accessible flat, uh, and he can, I, I, I think it'd kill me to take him and his power chair down the stairs now. Um, this is Emma Wedgwood. Uh, Emma Wedgwood was a carer for her mother, um, who was uh, uh, um, bedbound after a, a, a seizure. And she was also the carer for her older sister, Elizabeth, who had mobility problems because of a spinal um, curvature, curvature of her spine. Uh, Emma Wedgwood's mother uh, was also Charles Darwin's aunt, uh, and they fell in love when Darwin was visiting. Um, uh, yes, I'm afraid they were first cousins. It happened, it was the 19th century. Uh, Charles Darwin, when, when he visited to propose to Emma, so he'd met her when he was visiting and she was the carer for her mum and her sister. He visited again to propose to Emma and ended up telling her his theories on transmutation instead. So, classic nerd. Uh, Charles Darwin was ill for most of his adult life with a mystery illness that nobody seems to be able to diagnose to this day. Uh, loads of uh, fairly unpleasant symptoms, and he was quite ill at some time. He, he was very ill in in when Emma was pregnant with their first child. So not only was she heavily pregnant, she was also caring for her unwell husband. Uh, in 1842, they moved to the delightful Down House, uh, perhaps hoping that they'd been living in inner London, maybe hoping that would Darwin would recover. He didn't. He was ill for the rest of his life. Um, but Emma cared for him. 
uh, all the time. Uh, uh, she did get some help from their butler, Joseph Parslow, who learned how to do... Um, Charles Darwin had been visiting like spas and treatment centres and things uh, and had found hydrotherapy uh, quite helpful. So Joseph Parslow learned how to do it. He learned how to do hydrotherapy so Darwin wouldn't have to travel to spas. And um, so between them, Joseph Parslow and Emma looked after D -D Darwin. Um, Charles Darwin spoke of feeling safe and most well when he was with Emma and he was nervous uh, when she was not with him. Um, I, I, I can certainly relate to that. I think a lot of carers can, that you, you become very close to the person you're you're caring for. Um, uh, I'm pleased to say it's definitely made me and my husband closer. And I think we're both kind of anxious when we're away from each other. I hope Emma and Charles felt the same way. Charles Darwin did, I mean, he did appreciate, it's really nice to be appreciated by the person you care for. Uh, I certainly am, he tells me thank you every day. Um, but Charles Darwin, uh, when he, in his final illness in 1882, he told Emma, uh, it's almost worthwhile to be sick to be nursed by you. Uh, that's a bit cheesy but nice. And this is Francis Barber. Um, Francis Barber was born in, uh, born into slavery in Jamaica, uh, was brought to England and given his freedom uh, and eventually became the valet for Samuel Johnson, uh, the compiler of the first English dictionary. Uh, Samuel Johnson offered to pay for Barber to um, go to school and Barber chose to be an apothecary, trained as an apothecary, um, but went back to uh, Johnson in 1760. Um, I, I don't know whether that's why he became an apothecary, but he he would have had to, Johnson was, had a lot of ill health. Uh, when Barber first went to work for him, he was suffering from seriously from depression after his wife's death. Uh, he, he had um, a, a, a mental health complaint, which people now think is, was probably Tourette's. He um, had serious gout from around 1775. Uh, he had testicular cancer a couple of times and recovered both times. He had a stroke in 1783. And Francis Barber would have cared for him through all of that at their house in London, near Fleet Street. And look at all those stairs with severe gout and after a stroke. Poor old Barber carrying Johnson up that. He's a big lad. Um, but Johnson was certainly grateful to the man who'd looked after him uh, for through all those complaints. Uh, he left him a large amount of money in his will uh, and a house in Litchfield where Samuel Johnson had been born and where Francis Barber's descendants still live. Uh, and this is Louis Wayne, uh, Louis Wayne with Cat. Uh, Louis Wayne was, was a carer and also ended up needing the care of somebody. Um, Louis married uh, his sister's governess, Emily, um, although Emily sadly suffered from breast cancer and was bedbound for the last three years of her life, and Louis was her carer. Um, they were delighted by a little cat, a stray cat that adopted them and used to come into the house. They called him Peter and they, they kept him, and Louis Wayne used to draw him, and that was his big break, um, was uh, a picture of Peter. Th this isn't a picture of Peter, but this is the sort of thing Louis Wayne was most famous for, those kind of anthropomorphic cats. Um, yeah, I, I think. A lot of carers, if you have cared for somebody who's who's bed bound, as I have, you do find when your world shrinks to just a bed and a chair beside it, the smallest things um, like a stray cat coming in can can be just the world, uh, really. I mean, it was watching birds for us. We gave all the pigeons names, a little bit nerdy, and also enjoyed watching every episode of Doctor Who, but that's another story. Uh, but yeah, really small things like a cat wandering in can be can be much more impactful than they were when you were living a life like everybody else. So yes, poor old Louis Wayne. Uh, Emily sadly passed away from from best breast cancer, uh, and Louis went to live with his mother and sisters in Westgate on Sea um, in eighteen uh, eighties. Sadly, uh, his mother died just 10 years or so later, and then one of his sisters died a few years later. And then and Louis Wayne's um, mental health started to suffer after the death of his mother and his sister as well. Uh, he began to become rather eccentric. Um, he, his paintings became extremely abstract, although that could just be that he was experimenting with that kind of art, I suppose. Um, he invited people to the Crystal Palace Cat Show which 
doesn't exist. It was a commission he'd got from a paper. It wasn't real. Uh, he became paranoid that his sisters were stealing from him and eventually became violent towards them. Which, uh, that must be dreadful. Uh, they they kind of admitted defeat, admitted that they just couldn't care for him well. And in 1924, they sent him to uh, an asylum, into eventually to Bethlehem Royal Hospital, but continued to advocate for his care. Uh, so they made sure he had the best care. They went to see him every week. Um, they wanted him moved to a private room so that he could have a pet cat because he so loved cats and he couldn't have one, uh, which he eventually did to get the private room and the cat. Um, and so they were still struggling to make his care the best they could, even though he was in a hospital. I, a lot of carers, I think, can uh, identify with that. I think I, I certainly feel just helpless when when Gordon's been in hospitals or or uh, when he was in a respite home several years ago. Uh, you feel kind of helpless not being able to do what you do, care for that person. Um, but Louis Wayne's sisters seem to have been a formidable force and made sure he was well cared for at Bethlehem. Um, this is suffragette Jessie Payne, um, who, who one of a uh, few working class suffragettes. Uh, she was a bootmaker in Bethnal Green. Um, she cared for Sylvia Pankhurst at her home in Bethnal Green after Sylvia Pankhurst was released from prison after being force fed and was rather unwell. So Jessie Payne took her in. Uh, Jessie Payne was also the carer for her disabled daughter, um, who's described on the census again, one of those dreadful Victorian descriptions as an imbecile. That could be a lot of things. Um, Jessie Payne managed to get herself attached to a deputation to see Prime Minister Asquith uh, in, um, in um, 1915, 1916, I forget, sorry. Uh, she, when it got to her time to speak, um, she spoke out about the Mental Deficiency Act of 1913, which had allowed mentally ill children to be removed from their parents and placed in institutions without consent, without the parents' consent. Um, Jessie Payne made it known that she was upset about that, but she was also upset uh, and the, the helplessness she had felt when a doctor told her that she had no say over what happened to her daughter, only the father did. Uh, and even the father could be overruled by the Mental Deficiency Act. Um, so she told off the prime minister uh, good old Jesse standing up for carers' rights a hundred years ago. Good honour. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, that's me and my husband being daft on red nose days. Sorry about that. And other carers, please don't judge my very untidy filing cabinet in the background there. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that. If you are a carer, um, remember that even if you do feel alone, people have been caring for their loved ones and vulnerable members of society since we were humans and um, so you're part of a really important tradition dating all the way back to the stone age and including princesses and poets and suffragettes and viking raiders um if you are a carer and you need help please even if you don't think you do seek all the help you can try everything something's going to stick go on to carers uk they've got loads of resources friends family Try everything, honestly. Don't, don't. I was in denial for so many years um, that I didn't need help, and I did. Um, so look for help. Um, if you're not a carer, but you know a carer, please make sure they feel uh, valued. They know they're valued. Go around with a cup of tea and a cake, give them a ring, tell them they're doing the most important work in the world, which is keeping another human being alive. And if you don't know another carer and you're not a carer, um, donate to the Carers Trust or Carers UK. They'll look after a carer on your behalf. Um, I hope you've had fun hearing about carers in history. Um, I've tried to be upbeat and positive. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good day.